All right, picking up where we left off on whatever day that was, Tuesday, um, I'm going to try to get us through the Wanderer today. I barely squeaked through with my previous class, and they were a few lines ahead of me, guys. So we spent several minutes, well, nearly the entire period, um, talking about those first few lines. The longing for mercy and all that. I want to get down to uh, line five. So the speaker says, or someone says, let me put it that way. Um, Always the one alone, longs for mercy, the maker's mildness, though troubled in mind across the ocean ways, he's long been forced to stir with his hands the frost cold sea and walk in exile's paths. Okay? The exile's paths, I had written up on the board the other day, um, is an interesting phrase because it's actually one word in Old English, it's not two words. And the word is. Reclastas, okay? The first part of that word, the rack, we do use. It just doesn't sound the same. Um, the second part, we only use in a very, very specific context. Anybody know, sorry to offend anybody, I was trying to get my leg up there, what that is called? Soul. Soul. Anybody know what else? It's shape. If you were a cobbler, shoemaker, it's called the last. L-A-S-T. If you're into, uh, if you become a police investigator, you know, you'll learn all about different lasts, different shapes of souls, all right? Just like tire tread kind of a thing. So, last thing there, footprints, all right? But the rec part, your, your um, translation says exile. Doesn't have any meaning of, of any reference to the, that old English word has no similarity to the modern English word exile. Exile comes from either Greek or Latin, okay? But we do have a word in English that we use that comes directly from this word, wretch and wretched. Why? Why don't we use wretched? So-and-so is wretched to mean an exile. Because you can wake up feeling wretched and not literally be in exile. I mean, with COVID and everything, most people who did wake up wretched did become exiles, so to speak, because of you know, quarantining and all that kind of stuff. But to be in exile is to be modern English, you know, meaning of the word, wretched. Because what are you really if you're wretched? Not good. Yeah, <laughs> kind of way of putting it, not good. You're downcast. Everything is horrible if you're wretched. I call my cats wretched one and wretched two. They drive me crazy, right? An exile means to be what? Gone. Why does Edward Snowden live in Moscow and not in Washington, D.C.? Or Honolulu, where he lived before? Because he's not welcome in the United States. He lives in exile. Why did the Soviet Union exile Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the 1970s? Because he was no longer welcome at home because of books he'd written about the Soviet system and such. Um, they couldn't kill him because he was a Nobel Prize winner. You don't off, you know, Nobel Prize winners, all right? So the speaker says it had to walk in exile's paths. Go back to what are you if you are in exile? You're a person without a home. I mean, you might have a home where you are actually living, but it's not the home that you are actually part of, were part of, all right? You persona non grata there. You are a person without grace, without favor, without merit, etc. there, okay? So, 
And notice the speaker says, had been forced to. Like, something moved him. Uh, if any of you take a Shakespeare course where you read some of Shakespeare's history plays, various people get exiled. Sometimes the exile is permanent. You have to go to France and stay out of England for the rest of your life. Sometimes it's partial. Ten-year exile. And then you can come back kind of a thing. All right? And then you get the phrase, weird is fully fixed. We talked about weird the other day, right? With the fourfold Germanic ethic. What is it? Fate, kind of, you know, what will be, will be. But the Old English doesn't literally say fully fixed. It says weird. I'll give you the Old English. Bit full rad. Okay? Leave off this intensifier, this prefix for a moment, and just look at that word. R, the next letter is called an ash. It's a digraph. It's two sounds, or it represents two sounds pushed together. All right? Rad. Where have we had a name that has that sound in it? Anybody remember? Louder? Ethelred. Okay? We also have it in his grandfather. Alfred, which gets changed to Alfred. It's not Alfred, like Al Fresco, okay? It's Alfred. Red doesn't mean fixed, established. Red means something else. We use this term today in its old English meaning in only one context. We use it in another context all the time. Some of you are doing it right now. Read. Okay. So what's the other context? When does the word, let's put it in its modern English, when is that word used but it doesn't mean read? I mean, you might think it does mean read. According to the Supreme Court, decision in 1962, 63, something like that, if you are arrested, what must the arresting officer do? Read your rights. You must be read your rights. Does that mean literally the cop has to pull out, you know, a three by five car to go, you have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be given to you. You have the right to, you know, etc. Now, maybe it's a really dumb cop and literally does have to read it. Most cops, by the time they graduate academy, they memorized the Miranda rights. They're very short, right? So why do we say you have to be read your rights? It doesn't mean read from a piece of paper. It goes back to the old English meaning which is advised, counseled. Because what are you actually, I'm going to combine the two now, what are you actually doing when you're reading? You're advising yourself from what you're taking in. Hopefully. I'll get on a soapbox for just like 10, 20 seconds. If you're not advising yourself if you're not taking in what's there you're not really reading okay you're using reading means to take it in like you eat and drink it comes into you it becomes part of you and hopefully in one way or another you're ever so slightly changed by it okay off so far so weird is fully read weird is fully your gloss your translation says fixed. What if it's not fixed? What if it's advised? What if it's counseled? Like, how many of you have ever seen the old Charlton Heston, the old Brenner Ten Commandments? Used to be on TV every Easter. 
has nothing to do with Easter. I don't know why. It would be on you know Easter time. But yet Yul Brynner played the character of Ramses. And when he becomes Pharaoh, he says this line again and again and again. So let it be written, so let it be done. That is written, advised, and now carried out. Here the speaker is saying, weird is fully. So if it's advised and going to be carried out, that's kind of set. That's kind of. And that's why he uses this translation, established, put into place. What does it ultimately really mean? You can't escape it. That's why I talked about Soph Sophocles and Oedipus the other day. Or, as I should pronounce it, I was thinking about this later on in the afternoon, Oedipus is the correct pronunciation. All right? So, then we get, Thus spoke the wanderer, mindful of troubles, of cruel slaughters, and dear kinsmen's downfall. And our translation then has a colon. What does that colon indicate? There is no colon in the Old English. There's almost no punctuation in the Old English. I can, that's what I was going to do. Uh, hold on real quickly. Um, post. Um, I was going to show you what, you know, a manuscript page of Old English text looks like. It's just written without any breaks. No sentence breaks, it's just, or very, very few, okay? So what's the colon indicate? What usually indicates when you use a colon today? It connects the first part with what comes after the colon, right? Maybe. What Leusa is doing there for you is he's telling you everything that comes after is connected to thus. But that's not necessarily the case. The thus can mean what? What came before. Thus spoke the wanderer. Therefore, kind of like what he said before. Okay? Here's one of the big questions about this poem. How many speakers are there? So when the person says, thus spoke, is that referring to what came before and what came after? And so there's really only one speaker other than the person who said, thus spoke. So are there one, two, or as some suggest, three speakers in the poem? It's unclear. Does it change one's interpretation? Yeah, it might, okay? Probably not as much as, take that back, definitely not as much as how you translate those two words, R.A. and Ubedith. Remember the longs for, experiences, awaits, expects, mercy, favor, grace, earthly prosperity. How you do those, everything. Okay? I think at least. Could be wrong. Don't think so. So, Thus spoke the wanderer, mindful of troubles. The, the old English there is, where'd it go? Erbatha Yemindi. In his mind, full of what's called Erbatha, problems, troubles, situations. He's got a lot on his mind. And the narrator, by, by giving us this, or the persona, by giving us this, thus spoke the wanderer, that might be saying, the reason he's saying this, because he's got a lot on his mind. More than the mind can deal with. Mindful of troubles. What kind of troubles? What comes after? Cruel slaughter. And dear kinsmen's downfall. Yeah, that'd be kind of troublesome. Because who's the dear kinsman? Notice, kins, men, plural, family, tribe, clan. How many kinsmen? We don't know exactly until we get later on in the poem. 
I'll give it away. He's the last one. He is the last surviving member of his group, whatever his group is. Okay? That's pretty telling. What do people who often survive a horrendous catastrophe experience afterwards? Survivor's guilt. Survivor's guilt. Why me? Why did I live? And these people, that, when the big tornado came through Murfreesboro in 2009, 2010, there were a couple of houses over off Thompson Lane where, you know, this house survives intact, not a scratch. And the house literally 30 yards away, gone. Just nothing left. And the house on the other side, gone. And the people in this house were like, especially good person that the world says, no, 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 you live in the other. Cruel slaughters, dear kinsman's downfall. So your translation is telling you that now what comes is what thus spake the wanderer. Often alone in the first light of dawn, I have sung my lament. That is, I've recited my sorry tale. When? First light of dawn. What's that a nice euphemism for? He wakes up. Yeah. As soon as he wakes up, what's he think? Oh, crap. And he recounts his past. There is none living to whom I would dare to reveal clearly my heart's thoughts. Why? Is it that he doesn't trust anyone? He lost everyone. Or everyone's dead. See? Those are two possibilities. <clears throat> now we've been told, dear kinsman's downfall. So everyone that he loves, that he might be willing to tell, is dead. It's one possibility. What could the other one be? That he just doesn't trust someone. Well, look at what follows. So there is none living to whom I would dare to reveal clearly my heart's thoughts. I know it is true that it is a nobleman's lordly nature to closely bind his spirit's coffer, hold fast his treasure hoard, whatever he may think. That kind of implies it's not that there is absolutely no one living to, he, to whom he would reveal his innermost thoughts. It's what? Louder? Okay, but it's more than just not trusting others. It's what does the lordly nobleman do? Keep to himself. He is not a, you know, 1990s to now, you know, um, modern, in touch with his feelings guy who goes on Oprah and spills the beans. He's what? There's a classic phrase that, that describes the Brits. It's close. Stoic is a word I've got up here. It, it does describe it. Three word phrase. Bingo, whoever said that. Stiff upper lip. What does that mean? If you have a stiff upper lip, what are you not doing? You're not showing any emotion. That is, whatever happens. Another phrase. There used to be a comic strip named this. I don't think it's around anymore. Grin and bear it. You grin even though inside your world is crumbling. Very, very, very brief story off to the side. One of the times when I was teaching my Harry Potter course in London was 2005. The day before we flew over. Wait, was it the day before or the night? No. The night that we flew over, July 5th, 2005, was the day, that morning, London had a series of terrorist attacks, trains and buses, all right? I'd been to London a few times before then, got to London the next morning, because we left at like 8 o'clock at night and arrived 6 o'clock the next morning, and London was like nothing I'd ever seen before. 
Because when we got into Heathrow, got off the plane, got into Heathrow, you would see cops walking, and there were always like four of them walking abreast, shoulder to shoulder mentality, with semi automatic weapons, not slung over their shoulders, like this, with fingers on the trigger guard. You wouldn't, prior to that, you wouldn't see a semi automatic weapon anywhere in London except maybe outside number 10 Downing Street and some of the guards at Buckingham Palace, okay? Now you go to then, that day, you would see them everywhere. You'd be walking down Oxford Street, which is the main shopping center, shopping area in London, and you would see armed police on rooftops, just, you know, looking down at people, all right? But the attitude of the Brits was kind of, Come on. We survived the Blitz. We survived Hitler. Your puny little bombs aren't going to stop us. I mean, literally, that was the attitude. Okay? It was then that the old poster from World War II literally was rediscovered in a used bookstore in North England. Um, just had it, it's out of my mind. With the poster, anybody know what the poster said? Keep calm and carry on. That is, bombs dropping galore during the 1940, during the Blitz, 1941. Keep calm and what? Go about your business, just keep doing it. That's the attitude this character is expressing a thousand years earlier. That's why I said, you know, it's the quintessential British mentality, all right? English, I should say. So, I know it is true that it is a nobleman's lordly nature to closely bind his spirit's coffer. And kind of everything that comes after the that, it is a nobleman's lordly nature, for several lines is a gnomic passage. What do I mean by gnomic? Wisdom, proverb, an axiom. It is a truth the speaker is assuming. Everyone would agree to. Okay? So here's the axiom. It's a nobleman's lordly nature to closely bind his spirit's coffer. To hold fast his treasure hoard, that is, the heart, okay? Whatever he may think, whatever is in your mind, good or ill, good or bad, happy or sad, doesn't matter. Bind it up. The weary mind cannot withstand weird. Weary. What are you when you're weary? Tired. Yeah. Some of you are weary right now of this class. I can tell by the looks on faces. All right? Is it just tired? Is it just you didn't get, you know, you got six hours of sleep rather than eight? Or, you know, you've only gotten four hours of sleep the last four nights? No, it's not that kind of weary. What kind of weary is it? Like you're been through battle and more than you know in the past. And How many of you felt like towards the end of 2020, just beaten down? Okay. Or most of you don't aren't old enough to remember. Right after 9/11, it was like, man, now what? Okay. That's what he's talking about. So burdened with problems that the mind cannot do what? Cannot withstand, do I have that word up there? Yeah, I have part of it. Weird. What will be, will be. Fate. So what's it mean? What's really meant by weird here? Life. The weary mind cannot withstand everything life has to throw at you. Okay? But the word withstand, it's an interesting word. It's made up of two words. With and stand. What do we mean by the word with? Give me a synonym. Alongside. Alongside. That's when somebody said that in my first class. Perfect synonym for modern English with or together. Okay? 
It's the exact opposite of what it means in Old English. So Old English means against, opposed to, opposite. Because if you withstand something with the modern English understanding of with, what does that mean? It's Tony Blair flying to Washington, D.C. to stand literally next to George Bush and say, we stand shoulder to shoulder in this fight after 9-11. To withstand, and if you take both English component, but both components of that word, according to modern English, would mean we stand with you, which is why they'll say, we stand with you. They won't say, we withstand you, because that means suddenly, you know, you're now enemies. Interesting how those words change, right? Because the old English word that means to stand with is mid. And that's completely gone from the modern English language. It doesn't mean in the middle of. That comes from another place, right? So the weary mind cannot withstand. It can't. So what's meant by withstand? Oppose. It can't stand against fate. What will be will be. The troubled heart can offer no help. So do what? Bottle of pills. Bottle of vodka. End it all? How many of you are taking Shakespeare? Anybody? How many of you have taken Shakespeare? How many of you have read Hamlet? To be or not to be? Okay. No, no, no. That's not the good, quote, unquote, suicide speech. It's, oh, that this too, too sully flesh would thaw, melt, and resolve itself into a dew. That's the speech where Hamlet's contemplating suicide. Okay. The troubled heart can't help. The mind can't. So where are you going to get help from? And so, those, e those eager for fame often bind fast in their breast coffers a sorrowing soul, just as I have had to take my own heart, often wretched, cut off from my own homeland, far from dear kinsmen, and bind it in fetters ever since long ago. I hid my gold-giving friend in the dark. Notice how long this line is. Okay, da 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 Treasure giver, accustom me to joy. That's when that finally ends. So he says, you can't fight it. So what do you do? Take one of those slogans. <laughs> you grin and bear it. You stiff upper lip it. You keep calm and carry on. Notice what isn't an option. Giving up. Which would mean what? Oh, to take this bare bodkin, Hamlet, and suicide. Not an option. It's not even mentioned. Okay? So, those eager for fame. Why, why if you're eager for fame, would you hoard everything up in here? Notice it kind of suggests, by not spilling the beans... That is what will produce fame. Well, where does fame come from? Bingo. Other people. It's what other people say about you. Because what if, just, what do you think of somebody who always, constantly, hurt, my pants are too small, don't have enough food, my car's a piece of crap, what do, you, what do we kind of generally say? You know, she's sitting there going, hey, hey, hey. You go all psycho. <laughs> um, whiny, right? Nobody likes to be around whiny people. So the opposite of that is, whew, look at everything this person has going on. And doesn't complain a bit. Just keeps on trucking. So... Just as I have had to. What? So, 
The wise man knows that the nobleman does this, just as I have done what? I've taken my heart, often wretched, and I've done what? Cut off from my own homeland. Ah, we get some, uh, some additional information about the speaker. He's not at home. The speaker is the one walking in the exile's paths. Far from my dear kinsmen, bind it in fetters. Fetters, handcuffs, manacles. Ever since, long ago, I hid my gold-giving friend. I've done this for a long time. So what is that telling us about the speaker? Is he 20? No. 30? Mm, probably not. 60? Highly likely. Hid my gold-giving friend in the darkness of earth. Yara Yeo, that's long ago. Gold wina mine. Literally, gold friend, mine. My gold friend. The giving is implied. Okay? What is the purpose of translation? So someone else can read it and, as Bede says, get the gist of it, right? The Old English is almost literally gold-giving friend. But what is meant by gold-giving friend? He doesn't just mean a friend who gives him gold. Because that's what it sounds like that means. Gold-giving friend is a metaphor. It means Lord. Remember the other day I had written up here, right around here, Lord Thane relationship, duty to one's Lord, duty to one's kin, duty to avenge one's Lord and kin, etc. And the Lord Thane relationship is, if I'm a warrior and I go off and I fight in a battle for my Lord and I live and we win and we come back and we bring all this treasure and we give it to the Lord, that's the first part of the equation. What's the second part? The Lord has to reciprocate. The Lord gives us treasure in return. Okay, My gold-giving friend. That's the Lord. You're going to hear that phrase used a lot throughout Old English. Okay, But it means Lord. So why not translate it Lord? Because gold-giving friend, for a modern English audience, that's not clear that he's referring to his Lord. So, ever since long ago, I hid my gold-giving friend in the darkness of earth. Meaning, I buried him. Now, I'm not suggesting that he should say, ever since I buried my Lord a long time ago. That's more an adaptation than a translation. That's a simplification. And one of the things Leuza is attempting to do, and he does it better than almost anybody, Take that back. He does it better than anybody in terms of translating all the Old English poetry. Is he's trying to model it after that Anglo-Saxon alliterative pattern. Okay, he's attempting to. We can't do it perfectly because of how the language has changed in a thousand years. So he had to bury his Lord a long time ago. Duty to the Lord, duty to kin, duty to avenge one's Lord and kin. It's often thought you should die in battle with your Lord. If your Lord's going to die in battle, you should die too. Well, what if you win and your Lord dies early on? Yay, us. Uh, now you get a new Lord. It doesn't mean if your Lord dies early on and you win, y'all got to go, all right, guys, we've got to kill ourselves so that we die with our Lord. doesn't imply that. So he hid his Lord in the darkness of earth, and he went wretched. Same word that gets earlier translated as exile. Winter said over the ice lock waves. Why did, it wasn't only his Lord that died. It's everybody's dead. We're going to find out later. And it's been alluded to earlier. And apparently it happens in wintertime. Because... The ice locked waves. Why did he leave? Because he sought hall sick, that is sick for a hall, wanting for, longing for 
a hall. Because what is a hall in Anglo-Saxon culture? Home. It's home. It's everything. It is what defines one's identity. Okay? I think I started to mention the other day, it's why Socrates drank the hemlock rather than left Athens when he had the opportunity to leave Athens. Because he's like, if I leave Athens, I'm leaving really who and what, everything I am and that I believe in. So, I sought, Paul said, a treasure giver. In other words, a new lord, a new king, a new chieftain. Wherever I might, far or near, someone in a meat hall who might know my people. He was looking for somebody else who he could say, have you heard of the Joneses? Oh yeah, I knew Fred Jones a long time ago. There's a connection there, right? To be kind of facetious. Someone who might know my people, or, or, big or, who would want to comfort me friendless, accustom me to joy. Or someone, even if he doesn't know the people I'm part of, would want to say, come on in. Take a seat. I'll feed you. I'll house you. You can become part of my company. He who has come to know how cruel a companion, sorrow. So he who has come to know, it's a classic beginning of a gnome, another gnomic passage. If you've been in my shoes, what? You will know what this is like. So he who has come to know how cruel a companion is sorrow for one with few dear friends. What does he mean by few dear friends? How many few dear friends does he have? What did you say? Zero. Yeah, he's got zero. This is an example of what's called litotes. It's extreme understatement. How few dear friends? Zero. We're going to see when we get to the dream of the rude, which is a poem about a man who dreams that the cross of Christ speaks to him. And at one point in the poem, the cross is going to say, you know, when Jesus died, there were a few of his troops left with him. How few? Zilch. Okay. How cruel a companion is sorrow for one with dear friends. What? Finish the phrase. Misery loves. Why? Okay, but why does misery love company? Empathy, someone to bring the beer, you know, it's someone else to, what's the, another word, longer, comes from Latin, to commiserate with. Co, meaning with, together, miserate, related to, misery, to co-misery with. It's easier to endure it with your, if you're with someone else. So, the person who does that will understand. Will understand what? What comes after the colon? Again, no colon in the original. The path of exile claims him. What does that mean, claims? What is the old English there? I don't think I've ever thought about that. Line 32. The path of exile... Yeah, okay, I can see that. Claims him. It's like it says, you're mine. Weird. <laughs> what will be, will be. There's no escaping this. Path of exile claims him. Not patterned gold. In other words, his life isn't meant for what? What's meant by patterned gold? Gold treasure. Gold in the form of, you know, carvings and things like that. It's material wealth. Your life is what? As opposed to my life, let me use this, my life as opposed to Elon Musk's, Bill Gates, George Soros, 
Just keep listing your filthy rich people. I'm not filthy rich. The speaker is saying different path. And it's implied. Nothing this person can do is going to change that. This isn't like a knight's tale where you can change your stars. This is, this is the path, as Tolkien will put it in the Lord of the Rings, this is the path that is laid for him. And it's not like he can go, oh look, there's a path there. Maybe that one leads to wealth and happiness. I'll take door number one. Nope. It's like the path gets put as you're walking. And there's no deviating from it. Not pattern gold. Wells claims him. A winter bound spirit. Not the wealth of the earth. Winter bound spirit. Not the wealth of the earth. Well the first line. Path of exile. Not pattern gold. It's almost like they're opposites. Second line. Hmm. Path of exile. Winter bound spirit. How is winter, a winter-bound spirit not the wealth of the earth? What's meant by wealth? It can have a couple of meanings. In winter, everything's dying cold. Winter, everything's dying cold. You're not going to, you know, if you're out for a walk in the winter, you know, great actor Julian Sands is currently missing in the San Bernardino Mountains. He's been missing for going on near two weeks now. Went for a hike, big old snowstorm hit probably dead, okay? What would one reason be? Well, avalanches and all that, but what else? Freezing, Freezing. food? You, you don't find food naturally, you know, growing on trees, middle of January, okay? Winter bound spirit, bound by winter, not the wealth, the prosperity of the world. And that can mean, that can mean the agricultural prosperity. When is that? July, August, September, everything's, you know, growing and bountiful and such, as opposed to January, February, okay? He remembers hall holders, thanes, warriors, and treasure taking. Not treasure giving, treasure taking. That probably means treasure receiving, not as we'll see when we get to Beowulf, hall holders, like you guys are holding a hall, and I'm the advance force of an invading army. And what are we going to do? We're going to take the hall. <laughs> and you're dead. Okay? Because we're going to come in and slaughter you. Not, I don't think it's that kind of treasure taking. I think it's the reception because the Lord is giving it. How in his youth, his gold gift, there it is again, his gold giving, but now we get Lord. Accustom him to the feast. Almost implies this guy was a favored retainer. Like he, he got pride of place in sitting at the table. That joy has all. Think of something that's faded. What does it no longer have? Think of a photograph. If any of you know what an actual physical photograph even looks like anymore. <laughs> what happens to the colors? Give me another word. They disappear. They're not as rich. They kind of bleed out together. It's kind of, well, it's like Peck Hall compared to most other buildings in the world. It's kind of bland. It's nondescript. That joy, the joy that he remembers, has faded. Faded where? How many of you don't, you guys are all too young. How many of you don't remember some things that you used to remember? I could go, like, yesterday, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, yeah. My siblings, who are all older than me, the next one's three and a half years older, and the oldest one's a little over seven years older than me, they remember stuff from our childhood, and I'm like, I don't remember 
remember that at all, because I was too young to remember it. Your text has a break in the text. It's not just a stanza break in that the next line is indented to indicate a stanza break. It's you've got white space between this text and this text. Why? It's not in the manuscript. This is where you can kind of talk about the rhetoric of printing, how printing material on a page can affect your awareness, understanding, and interpretation of it. What does that kind of break possibly indicate? Could be change in speaker. Usually there's a verbal cue that will indicate that. Big pause. Big pause mental break, as it were, like, okay, I gotta go use the restroom and then I'll be back, you know, five minutes, everybody, you know, chill kind of a thing. Almost like the speaker's thinking, what's to prepare for what comes next? And so, he who has long been forced to forego his Lord's beloved words of counsel will understand, notice, has been forced to forego his Lord's beloved words of counsel. Why has this speaker been forced to forego his Lord's beloved words of counsel? Because he's dead. Dead men don't speak. We'll understand what, what comes next. When sorrow and sleep both together often bind up the wretched exile, it seems in his mind, in the mind of the wretched exile, that he clasps and kisses his Lord of men, and on his knee lays hands and head, as he sometimes long ago in earlier days enjoyed the gift throne. Notice the time emphasis. Long ago, earlier days. What, what's the speaker doing? Okay, but what else? What's he emphasizing? This was a long time ago which is also indicating something about the speaker's age. This guy's old. Could be trying to remember, okay? So what is it that we're told when sorrow and sleep both together bind the wretched exile? He's falling asleep, right? Sleep binds him. If you're in the binds of sleep, you right? But that happens along with sorrow. He can't escape his dreams. What are his dreams? What comes next? Here's what he dreams of. It seems in his mind he clasps and kisses his Lord of men. What is the huge difference between American culture and European culture? Male friendship, male greeting. If you're Greek, I've got a friend who's Greek, female friend who's Greek, raised Greek, everything. But in Greek society, when men who haven't seen each other for a while, and they're friends, they're not, you know, just meeting, and they're friends, when they come at each other, or Russians, they do the same thing. They clasp each other and a kiss on this cheek, two, they do it three times, this cheek and this cheek. Three kisses, okay? That's kind of the implication here. Americans, <laughs> homosexual gay we don't I'm, I'm straight man I'm gonna do that here's my hand feel me grip your hand you know, the whole nine yards right that's not this this you know the clasping and greeting this is a sign of friendship and welcoming etc and so what does he do he it seems in his mind that he's doing this with his lord and what on his knee he lays hands and head so hands and in head. What's this an indication of? This isn't greeting and friendship. Supplication. Yeah, we're happy. Right now. This is supplication. What does it mean to supplicate someone? You're begging for something from them. Usually, in literature, mercy. You're asking for a mercy or a blessing. If you go to the Old Testament, Almost always, that's an indication of blessing. A child, a son goes to his father, father, give me your blessing. 
story of Jacob and Esau with Isaac. You know, what do they do? They put their hands on his knees. He put, he lays his hand on their head. Um, Virgil's Aeneid. You have a character go up to the uh, one character go to the character Aeneas when he's been defeated in battle. I think the character's name is Turnus. He goes up to Aeneas. He clasps him around the knees and he begs for mercy. And Aeneas whips out his sword and goes, no, you know, right down his neck. All right? You've got a footnote here. The description seems to be some sort of ceremony of loyalty charged with intense regret and longing. I don't know about the regret part because I don't see that. I see the longing unless the regret is... The very fact of putting the hands and head on the knee is an indication, oops, I've done something wrong, be merciful. That's the only way I think you can see that regret part. Anyways, he goes on. As he sometimes long ago in earlier days enjoyed the gift throne. All right? That is the presence of the Lord who sat on the throne. But, when the friendless man awakens again. So this is happening in his sleep. Now what do you think that means for the person in this guy's position, who's friendless, who's an exile, who has no home, who has no people to call his own, and he falls asleep for a few moments, and this flits through his mind. What might this be for the speaker, or for the person who has this dream? Good dream, bad dream. Good dream, bad dream. Could, wakes up and realizes it, was it could be both. I think the bad dream, maybe when he wakes up and goes, no. How many of you have ever woken up from a dream before and you're like, no, come back, come back, come back. please, I don't want to face Sherman again. To, you know, I can't tell you how many times I woke up when I was in college. I'm like, no. He wakes up. And he sees what? It's like the guy's lying in his little boat, opens one eye, and is like, damn, there's that ocean again. He's gently rocking. What's he see out on the ocean? He sees before him the fallow waves, sea birds bathing, spreading their feathers, frost falling. So what does it mean, spreading their feathers? Extending their wings. So they become not just a small bird, but now a larger bird. They take on a form. This is going to be important. And what's happening weather-wise? Snow and hail and frost, right? Then the heart's wounds are that much heavier, longing for his loved one. Why? Because he dreams. Wakes up, no Lord. And he's brought back to the immediacy of his situation. Sorrow is renewed. When the memory of kinsmen flies through the mind, okay, your gloss tells you it can also mean when the mind surveys the memory of kinsmen. Then what do you do with the lines that follow? He greets, he greets who? He greets them with great joy. Greedily surveys hall companions. Wait, who's he greeting with joy? What hall companions is he surveying? What's the only thing he has seen once he opened his eyes? Birds. Uh, what might be happening? <laughs> He's tripping. That's a pretty good way of putting it. Hallucinating? That's the way these, these lines are often interpreted. This guy sees these seabirds. The next poem we're going to read, the seafar, seafarer, lists a bunch of these birds. The curlew, the gannet, the swan, and there's like three or four others. It's very similar imagery. He sees these birds, and he... He's just woken up from a dream, and what happens 
between the dream and what he sees. He hallucinates. Those aren't birds. It's Fred. It's Tom. It's George. And what does he hear? He doesn't hear voices. He hears the birds cry. They always swim away. The floating spirits bring too few familiar voices. An example of? Lecapes. How too few. He doesn't understand their language because they're not speaking Old English. Cares are renewed. So sorrow is renewed. Cares are renewed. The little bit of respite from his sleep, gone. I kind of doubt, I could be wrong, forgive me if I am, I kind of doubt any of us have been in this guy's shoes. I've known guys in the military who have kind of been in this guy's shoes. Friend fought in the Battle of Fallujah, and I mean smack dab middle, the whole thing. Lost a lot of buddies. PTSD, yep. I think I told you I had a graduate student one year. We got to this poem, I mean it was like end of September. We got to this poem, and he had to drop. Because, I mean, it was just sending up flares left and right. Because he immediately was like, oh, this, this, this is like being special ops. This, this guy was a special ops warrior. He was, and I can't do it, Dr. Sherman. It just, I was like, don't worry. <laughs> Not a problem. And so I cannot imagine, cares are renewed for one who must send over and over a weary heart across the waves. The grammar reference of this intense, almost hallucinatory scene is not entirely clear. They actually use it admitting, we're not exactly sure what this means. This is one interpretation, one common reading that's given, okay? Notice. You get that white space break again. It's almost like the speaker is pausing in thinking, gathering thoughts. And so I cannot imagine for all this world why my spirit should not grow dark when I think through all this life of men, how suddenly they gave up the hall floor and mighty young retainers. What does that mean? I cannot imagine for all this world why my spirit should not grow dark. Yeah. Or put it in the negative the way he does. Don't tell me to smile. Don't tell me, you know, you should have joy. I, I, personal example. <clears throat> October 1983. No, 1983? No. 19. Yes, October 1983. I was. Um, I can't remember the exact day, 20-something. I was at church with my then quasi-almost girlfriend and her roommate. And word had been announced early that morning about the bombing at the Marine barracks in Beirut, Lebanon. 240-some Marines killed. And I was in a pretty foul mood. I'm a right-wing, gung-ho, Reagan's Jesus, you know, the whole nine yards. My mentality. Um, and her name, quasi girlfriend, now wife, I'll tell you the story sometime, ditched me, stomped on my heart, and then I ignored her, and she came crawling back to me. Anyways, roommate, whose name was Joy, right, said, Oh, Ted, everything's in God's hands. God's in total control. You should have joy. And I'm like, Shut the up. This is in church. <laughs> Don't tell me. I should have joy and a smile on my face when these 240 plus Marines are dead and their families are being notified right now. So there's hundreds, if not thousands, suffering. Don't give me this, have a smile, Jesus loves you crap stuff. Okay? That's kind of what the speaker is getting at here. Okay? For all the dark in this world, he says, or for everything that happens, 
Don't tell me why I should not grow dark. What does he mean by grow dark? Get a little down. Get depressed. Or we could go all full 1950s existential and say life is meaningless. There's no point. That's not, big not, that's not what the poet is doing, though. There are some critics who read this poem and it's going, oh, this is like, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre and Camus had a baby and they produced this speaker, you know, and he's just, life sucks, and then you die, and there's no meaning. It's not what the poem's about. So, when I think through suddenly, when I think through all this life of man, how suddenly they, who's the they? Comes the next half line, the mighty young retainer. Notice who he's talking about dying. Young men. Book of Ecclesiastes. Ask the question at one point. Why do the young die? Billy Joel did it too. Why do the young die? The good die young. And the old go on. The wanderer is going to ask that question. The seafarer is going to ask that question. Beowulf's going to ask that question. And Tolkien, because his life was built around the old English stuff, asked the same question. Why do the young die and the old lie withering? Okay. What's his point? Why am I still alive when these young guys died? Thus this middle earth droops and decays every single day. Now what does that imply? If it droops and decays every day, here's today. So at this level, here's today. Where's yesterday? A little bit higher than the day before. A little bit higher. What's the other way of putting that? Here's today. Tomorrow? Here. Day, it, every day is what, folks? It's going to be worse than today. So if your life sucks today, what's that mean for tomorrow? More volume. More whatever you do to keep going. That's pretty bleak, right? This is at the almost exact middle of the poem. It's a little bit past the middle. Thus this middle earth drips and decays every single day, and so a man cannot become wise, not will not, cannot, before he has weathered his share of winters in this world. What's he mean? You can't get wise until, it can mean until you're old. It's one possible meaning. What's another meaning? Wisdom comes from suffering. Bingo. Wisdom comes from suffering or experience. You got to endure. Notice, the young retainers, they didn't what? They didn't weather their share of winters. Why? Because they died. You share, excuse me, you weather those winters, and what happens to you? Look at any derelict old barn throughout Rutherford County. It has weathered wood. What does that mean? It's worn down. It's lost its luster. Most of you are in your early 20s. Most of you women have nice, good complexions. You won't 50 years from now. Sorry. <laughs> Unless, you know, there's some new discoveries, you know, you Botox by the barrel at McDonald's, get your dinner, and, you know. <laughs> Shouldn't even go there because we're getting there. Okay? Age. The sun beats us down, etc. So, a wise man must what? No, make passage, by the way. Must be patient. What's that mean to be patient? You are all showing extreme patience. Be glad you're not in one of my three-hour classes, because I don't take breaks. It's just three straight hours. You know, I'd say get up and leave if you need to. And back when they could, you know, students would go out and you know, chug on the cancer sticks. What does it mean to be patient? Wait. To wait? Is it just waiting? Endure. To endure. See, she's in touch with this class. You endure. What do you, so 
is enduring like getting married. I mean, the, the <laughs> could be, I mean, like the actual wedding day. Most people actually look forward to their wedding day. Okay? Endure implies what? It's a struggle, right? It's hard. It's painful. Tell an eight-year-old boy or girl, doesn't matter, um, you know, a week before Christmas, there's the Christmas tree loaded with gifts. Only child, you know. So two only children I'm thinking of. If you're an only child, it doesn't apply to you. Two only children I'm thinking spoiled rotten because the parents wanted more kids and couldn't. And so, you know, 100 gifts. Week before, be patient. Plate of cookies, glass of milk, <laughs> not till after dinner. Okay, that's cruel. Because <laughs> you're saying, no, you have to wait. That's painful. What are you when you go to the hospital? Not to visit, <laughs> you get checked in. You become a patient. Same word. They, go, they both go back to the same root. It means to suffer. A wise man must be a sufferer, an undergoer, an endurer. Okay? What else must he be? Not too hot hearted nor too hasty with words. What's it mean, too hot hearted? Yeah, someone calls you a name and you kill them. Had an incident several years ago. Was it hot hearted in words? We had a student, where am I? That's Peck, so Bell parking lot's over there. Had a student waiting in a parking spot and another, you know, in some bigger car, and another student, because of how the person pulled out, zipped in behind in a Volkswagen Beetle. And the person waiting stabbed her. <laughs> Literally, stabbed her. I don't think the student who took the parking spot died, but the other one did go to prison. Attempted murder. Okay, Don't be too hard-hearted. It's a freaking parking spot, folks. Don't go crazy about it. It's okay to be late. Anyways, too hard-hearted nor too hasty with words. Read Hamlet. Read Polonius' advice to his son. A lot of people tell you it's bad advice. It's not bad advice. Everything he says to his son is good advice. The problem is Polonius doesn't follow his own advice. He's a hypocrite. He does the almost exact opposite of everything he tells his son. Okay, what else? Neither too weak in war nor too unwise in thoughts. Notice, it's okay to be, quote unquote, weak in war, but not too weak. And I think weak there means measured. But at some point, you have to what? Shock and awe. Again, Polonius' advice to his son. Don't get into a fight. But if you do, anybody know how the rest of it goes? <laughs> Thank you. Get into it in such a way that no one wants to get into a fight with you again. So, if you're going to get in a fight... Win. Nor too unwise in thoughts. Neither fretting nor fawning nor greedy for wealth. Notice the object there for <coughs> wealth. Fretting for, how do I get more? Okay. Fawning, this is mine. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Just counting your money all the time. My brother had a wife once who used to iron his money, and we would just, he didn't have much. <laughs> we would just ridicule, you know, make, like, why is she, they're $1 bills. I mean, if they're hundreds, I could understand. You want those nice, smooth, crisp. Anyway, fawning nor greedy. More, 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 more. Never eager for boasting before he truly understands. Truly understands what? What comes after. That is, what, literally, the next words he's going to say. Here's what he says about boasting. A man must wait when he makes a boast. Until the brave spirit, 
right? That's the spirit that makes the boast. I can do it. Understands truly where the thoughts of his heart will go. What's meant by the thoughts of his heart? His real innermost being. Because boasts are often made how or from where? Pride. Ego, pride, spur of the moment. It's Oedipus's one of Oedipus's problems. He's rash. Somebody challenges him, boom, he's there. All right? Not necessarily understanding what's going to happen when, to use a uh, phrase and worn out metaphor, the rubber meets the road. When you find yourself in that situation, we're going to see, for example, when we get to Beowulf. Beowulf makes all kinds of boasts. Beowulf fulfills every boast he makes. Why? Because Beowulf knows himself. Other characters in the poem apparently have made boasts too. And when Grindel comes knocking, they go running. Because Grindel's more than they thought he was. The wise man, break again, collecting his thoughts. The wise man must realize how ghastly it will be when all the wealth of this world stands waste. So the wise man must what? Must project to the future when the wealth of this world stands waste. What's meant by wealth there? Louder? Can be joys. I mean, wealth can be all kinds of things, right? You can be wealthy in monetary wealth. You can be wealthy in friendship. You can have lots of friends. Not social media. That's not friendship. That's, that's fantasy island. Okay? You can be wealthy in gifts, talents, time. I mean, I look at some people, I'm like, it's not fair, God. Why does this person look the way he does and have all these different talents? You know, somebody who can sing, dance, dance, look like, you know, I don't know, pick your male vision of beauty, whatever, and all these other abilities. And you go, like, and I can barely walk and talk at the same time. Okay? So all the wealth, it can be monetary wealth. It can be plants and animals. I don't know about you, I'm kind of glad I'm in Murfreesboro right now and not in various parts of Ukraine. Because various parts of Ukraine right now are pretty much devastated. As all, when all the wealth of this world stands waste, as now here. So the wise man will look forward, take that back, will Think now what it's going to be like then as right now here and there throughout this middle world, earth, walls stand blasted by wind, beaten by frost, the buildings crumbling. In other words, he's saying, you can get an idea of what it's going to be like then. How? There's a wall right there. What's the wall from? Doesn't necessarily tell us. We do get a passage later on, line 87, referring to the end of the work, which we'll talk about. These are the ruins of buildings built by people long ago. Okay? The Anglo Saxons, the English, as we can call them, they didn't build in stone, they built in wood. The Germanic tribes who came before them built in wood. They didn't build in stone. We have written accounts of people who came from northern Europe to Rome and saw Rome for the first time with the Forum, with the Colosseum, the Pantheon, and they were like, into your work. The works of giants. Giant. Humans didn't make this stuff. Humans can't make this. Well, you have no Colosseum in England. You have no Forum in England. But you do have places like Bath in London and the London Wall. And you do have also things like Stonehenge. 
A lot of people go to Stonehenge today. And even though they get all the description of how those stones are, you still go, come on. Pulleys? Really? Or the Egyptian pyramids. And because they can't understand how a human can do that, they come up with aliens. <laughs> yeah, aliens. So what is the as now here and there throughout this Middle Earth? Walls stand blasted by wind, beaten by frost, the buildings crumbling, the wine halls topple. Notice that's present tense. That's now. Their rulers lie deprived of all joys. The proud old troops all fell by the wall. Earlier we were told the young warriors were carried off. They got slaughtered quickly. The old guys, you know, they came defending the wall and they died there. The wall's still there. Where are the people? We're getting to that. War carried off some. Sent them on the way, one a bird carried off over the high seas, one the gray wolf shared with death, and one a sad-faced man covered in an earthen grave. So what's this bird that carried off a warrior? Any of those birds still around? A warrior, a guy, six foot, 180 pounds. There ain't no bird alive that can carry 180 pounds. He's not talking about a literal bird carrying a literal body. These are referring, this is a reference to what are called the bird, the beast of battle. Eagles, wolves, and there's a third one. Ravens, I think. What do they do? What do you do at the end of a battle? Well, the winning side picks the dead side of all the goods, okay, material stuff, and leaves the body. Why? Because you don't give a rat in the work for that. So what happens to the bodies? Do they just gradually decompose? Oh, no. Wolves, eagles, ravens come and scavenge. Okay. What do birds get first from a corpse? Eyes. Why? They're soft. They're easy. They're gooey. It, it's a little harder to pierce through skin. Watch any dead animal on the side of the road fairly soon after it's hit. And where do the vultures go for first? They go to the eyes. They go to the soft spots. Okay? That's probably what's meant there. And one, a sad-faced man covered in an earthen grave. What's that refer to? The speaker. What, are we, what were we told earlier he did? He buried his gold friend in the earth. The creator of man thus destroyed this walled city until the old works of giants, there it is, line 87, the Inta York, stood empty without the sounds of their former citizens. The word here that is empty, a couple of things I'm going to talk about. The word here for empty is idle. Here. The old English, I-D-E-L. It's modern English, idle. So the towns, the buildings now sit idle. Notice, without the sounds of their former citizens. Because what is the purpose of a building? To house for people to be in it. What is the purpose of a car? To go from A to B, right? What is a car doing when it is idling? It's not doing what it is supposed to do. Okay? So these buildings stand, it's not just that they stand empty. They stand not fulfilling their purpose. See, that's more important than just being empty. Go back for a second. The creator of men destroyed this walled city. Really? God reached down and said, Death, you know. That's not what he's implying. How did the creator of men do that? Through the battle. Through the battle. Weird. We're going to be told, if we haven't already been told, I think it's coming up later, weird exists up to heaven. But heaven is above weird. Weird doesn't have any effect in heaven. 
Go back and read. I told my first class, and some of them chuckled, and a couple thought I was serious. Go back and read before Tuesday's class the Old Testament. Okay? Obviously not being serious. And what do you see throughout the Old Testament? I mean, almost literally from the beginning, but definitely through the book of Malachi. What is it the story of? Because it is a story. In one sense, it is a single story. It is about the history of God with his quote-unquote chosen people, the Jews, the Israelites. And what happens? Repeatedly. God speaks to the Jews. They follow God. They reject them. They fall away. They get judged. They fall under subjugation of somebody else. The Philistines, the Egyptians, the Amalekites, the Moabites, the otherites, etc., etc. Nebuchadnezzar, Sennacherib, and what happens? God then rescues them, brings them back. They follow them again. Wash, rinse, repeat. Again and again and again and again. And yet in almost all of those instances, when a prophet speaks, what does the prophet say about the people who are coming in and taking the Jews captive? Agent of God. This is God doing this. Why? Goes back to the first line of the poem. Where is an example of the Old Testament of God really not being merciful? I mentioned it, I think, just a few moments ago. Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's just wipe them out. Okay? Just, but it's being merciful. And they come back and they follow, etc. It's God depriving the Jews, for example, of Jerusalem when they're carried off into the Babylonian captivity. So it's that mentality that is at work here. So, what time is it? Three minutes left. He who deeply considers with wise thoughts this foundation and this dark life, this foundation means this world, groomed, ground, and this dark life. Notice, not this happy Jesus loves you smiley face bumper sticker life. He does what? Old in spirit, Notice, you don't have to be old in age. You can be old in spirit if you, die, if you deeply, wisely consider this. Often remembers so many ancient slaughters, often remembers all these previous deaths, and says these words. It's what's called the ubisunt motif. Ubisunt comes from Latin. It means, where are? Why? Because there are Latin words that... Where are what? Where are those heroes of old? Beowulf is going to open, talking about in Yeyar Dagum, in the days of yore, when there were these mighty heroes. We still talk about this kind of stuff today, right? Because where are those heroes today? I don't mean to offend anybody, my daughter's one. They're not nurses, they're not doctors, they're not firefighters. Some are, etc. I'm talking the Achilles, however you say that. The Beowulfs, the Sir Gowans, the Arthurs. There aren't any, right? Name one. They're not real. <laughs> Where is the horse gone? Where is the rider? Where is the giver of gold? Where are the seats of the feast? Where are the joys of all? Why is the greeter, why does the speaker ask all these? Because they're all dead. The Old English. Where call mer? Where call magu? Where call magu mira? Where call simla yisetu? Where send and sell a dreamus? His point is Tolkien uses that almost that exact same language. By the way, in the Lord of the Rings, by having Aragorn sing these songs when he rides around a grave, he's kind of going, "Where are they?" Right. Oh, the glory of princes, how time, how the time passed away, slipped into nightfall as if it had never been. Now, just think of that last phrase. All these warriors, all these dead people, 
We could look back at previous age, I mean, we could talk about the founding of the United States, or we could go back to ancient Rome, or ancient Greece, or ancient whenever. As if they had never been means what? Like they didn't leave anything behind to remember them. How do we know about the founding of the United States? Because they left stuff behind. These people, the speaker is saying, what's left behind? Parts of the buildings. It's as if they never were. OK, we'll stop there. Should have gotten further. Um, we'll take about the first 10 minutes of class to finish the Wanderer, and then we will do the Seafair. Um, I'll probably put a quiz up. Sometime today or tomorrow. Won't be due till middle of next week at the earliest. That could cover some of the previous stuff, like that's on the extra credit quiz. Um, could cover obviously stuff up through the Wanderer. You'll get an email via D2L and it'll be announced also on the announcements page.